Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mark's Backyard Birds. Uh, doing a, a kind of a quick live tonight. Been kind of a crazy, hectic day and week. Uh, but I thought for the topic, uh, we get asked a lot about um, bird seed mixes and, you know, and, and, and how to make them better, and especially during the winter months when it's so cold and birds are in and, and the, a need for you know, extra nutrition. What are some of the ways? that we can uh, make our bird seed a little better or more uh, uh, nutritionally valuable for the birds that I have that are out there eating it. And um, one of the, the ways in it, you can always mix your, your, your bird seed together. And hello, Morgan. Uh, we are, and that being that we know things like peanuts, and, uh, you know, uh, sunflower hearts and some of these that are much more nutritionally valuable than a lot of the grains. So hopefully you've watched, you know, maybe my videos on quality bird seed. So feeding quality bird seed is key, but you can add things to kick it up either occasionally or every time you put bird seed out. And there are some, you know, readily really easy things to come by to help make your bird seed more nutritionally valuable, especially during these harsh winter months. So um, one of the things I like to do is I like to mix a couple of, hello, Steve K. We are uh, mixed together um, in the wild delight world. I love their nut and berry blend, but I also really love their uh, woodpecker chickadee nut hatch mix, which is very, very nut heavy. And nut, nuts are very high in oil, very high in fat. So I like to mix in uh, those two mixes together this time of year uh, to, to give more uh, really high fat, high oil, easy to convert into uh, energy for them and, and warmth. And you know, if you don't have access to that kind of seed, then just peanuts. These are peanut pickouts. And these are one of the things that is the most easy, you know, if you normally feed a uh, a, a just a good quality sunflower based mix that has a little bit of peanuts in it, then you can use uh, this. These are peanut pickouts that we have at the store that, and they're broken up pieces of peanuts. And I like to mix those in uh, to my uh, bird seed this time of year to give it extra peanuts. Now they, that woodpecker chicken nut hatch mix has a lot of nuts in it and mixing that in, you know, would make this kind of obsolete. But, you know, if you don't have access to, uh, a bird seed that you really, really like want to mix in, just plain peanuts is a very, very good idea, uh, especially in the winter months, to, to mix in with your bird seed to give those birds a little extra oomph. I like to call it kicking up, kicking up your bird seed um, with peanuts. Now, a couple of other ones that I really, really like are, these are suet nuggets, and these are just little balls of suet. And you know, beef fat, and then this has some fruit mixed in with it, and some nuts mixed in with it. And but they're in little nugget form, and I like just mixing those in my bird seed this time of year. So when the birds are up there picking it, and the only exception for this uh, putting this in your mix is it if you have really small openings on your on your bird feeders that maybe the soot nuggets might not fit through them so well. But in a, in a multi seed feeder or most hopper feeders, tray feeders, things like that, the soot nuggets are very safe, and there's lots of different different uh, flavors. This is a berry flavor. We have, there's also a peanut flavors and bluebird formulas and, and all different ones, but just mixing those in with your bird seed this time of year gives them that, that extra hit of, of the beef fat that is suet. And beef fat is very, very important during the winter months. So it's uh, considered to be the nutritional substitute for insects in their diet, uh, uh, suet is. So this is a good way to present suet if you don't want to go to the hassle of you know, doing a suet feeder or upside down suet feeder for one of those. So throw in some suet nuggets is another, another possibility. And then mealworms, dried mealworms. I love them. They, right now I have, I do a couple of different things with my dried mealworms this time of year. I have a, a bowl feeder. It's actually my, one of my jelly feeders uh, for my Orioles. Um, it, it, that I, instead of this time of year, don't have jelly out. So I just fill the bowl with uh, mealworms. And somebody suggested that he, they, he, he does it with a, a hummingbird feeder. He just takes the hummingbird feeder off. Oh, speaking of hummingbirds, hello, hummingbird. Good you're with, glad you're with us. 
they and, and mix that in and i also pour some mealworms in the the trays and mix them up and I, the, my bloopers really like that and they also like it when it's mixed with my medium sunflower chips in a tray for you so a lot of different ways you can add dried mealworms um I hope everybody just watching has unfrozen water for them because dried mealworms are just that they're dry. And so it's kind of, you know, I've, I've seen it published that, you know, they need to have access to water you know, to help with the processing of the dried mealworms. And, you know, my bird bass unfrozen and open 365 days a year because that is so important. But um, hummingbirds ask, how long can suet be stored out of a refrigerator? Now that depends on the the temperature outside the refrigerator. If you're keeping it in a cool, cool place, it can be stored for a long time. And it also depends on the formula of soot you have. You know, suet comes in two basic formulas. It comes in what is regular suet, which is the mainly the cold weather suet, and they also have no melt suets. And no melt suets are, are, are much more tolerant to warmer temperatures. But if you have just standard uh, tr traditional suet cakes, um, and we call them uh, treats in our in our world, but um, they, you know, they they can't stand getting too warm. Um, and I do not, you know, I, I, one of my rules that I was on last week about talking about mistakes people make feeding birds. One of them is, of course, feed is storing your bird seed inside, and that can be a disaster. And so. Um, if you're going to have the rule of thumb when it comes to storing bird seed, and this will apply to suet too, if you're going to, the longer you're going to keep it, then you're going to want to refrigerate it. You should never keep any bird seed longer than three months, unless it is refrigerated or put in and in, kept in your freezer at least part, part or most of that time. Um, you never leave seed in a feeder for longer than a month. And again, uh, suet kind of tells its own tale because it does get if it, it really warms up and it starts to turn. Uh, dark and, and get ooey and you know, it starts to ooze, definitely get rid of it then. But um, you know, keeping it in, it just depends on where your temperatures are. I wish I could tell you a threshold temperature, but I don't know for sure what that is really, uh, you know, because I, I usually don't have suet that long. You know, the birds go through it uh, fairly regularly. So you know, what are some of the, uh, you may have some ideas as to what you like to add to your bird seed. Um, a lot of, I know a lot of people like fruit. And they add raisins or dried cranberries or, um, you know, the, the important thing when you remember just same thing with peanuts and, and, and fruit, you definitely won't, don't want um, anything that's, that's flavored or treated because most of those are salt based treated and that is not bird, good for birds. They, that can help the aids in uh, dehydration whenever you're going to add a lot of salt into their, the diet. So uh, just 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 raisins, you know, and, and in the summer months, you'll hear me talk about um, to help attract bluebirds. Um, you, and it depends on your climate where you live, you can do that now. You actually can soak those raisins in water to get them good and plump and then maybe cut them in half and you can put those out uh, for your bluebirds and and even cedar wax wings and other birds that that, that discover them um i tell a story of a few years ago one of my customers here in kansas city uh had a bunch of grapes and raspberries and things in her refrigerator that were kind of all getting mushy so she put them in a, a, a pie pan and put them out on her deck in january and she put and it rained and of course the water you know soaked it in the pan and pie pan with all this fruit and lo and behold the bulls were, birds were coming up and a cape may warbler which is supposed to be in the bahamas in january uh came up and started drinking that sugar water that fruit water out of that, that pan so you know you think outside the box with your bird feeding and sometimes you get results that that you don't expect and that was a good example of that um but i've also had people put a, you know fruit like that in a bowl and set it on their deck railing and had a flock of cedar waxings come in and eat the the, the fruit out of that bowl so you you know when you're talking about you know the birds don't mind that those berries were mushy. They were still nutritionally valuable for them. Uh, they, they weren't so appealing to for the humans to eat. So, you know, putting them out there for the birds was a good idea and it, and it rewarded her. So, uh, you know, fruit, uh, meal, dried mealworms, especially uh, the, the suet nuggets uh, are, are you know, really good to put in a mix. And, you know, my, a lot of companies don't 
want to deal with uh, suet, and there's a lot of restrictions on suet, believe me, because it's an animal-based product um, that, that open themselves up for inspection. So while suet companies can deal with, deal with all that, bird seed companies don't want to put those intermixes because they would have to deal with that then. So they would rather you, aftermarket, add those soot nuggets to their bird seed mixes rather than the bird seed mixes coming with it already in there. And that's one of the reasons we, we definitely suggest that. So Joshua, hello, how are you? Oh, Southwest Michigan. Yeah, where are you? Uh, Steve and, uh, and uh, the Hummingbird, where are you? What part of the world are you in? We like to know that whenever we're doing these lives. And of course, we always uh, welcome the questions, you know, that let us know what uh, you came on thinking maybe you get something answered. Please put it out there because you never know how many people are, at, are thinking about the same question you are. So the there's lots of ways. Nutritional value is very, very important to the birds. Well, uh, we encourage you when you're looking and shopping at your on your bird seed. Steve's in South Alabama. Cool. When you're looking at your bird seed uh, bags on the shelf in your store, flip them, up, flip them over and, and look at the, uh, the nutritional value on them and compare them. And hummingbirds in California, hey, that is, you have year-round hummingbirds in California. Our hummingbirds are long gone. Although we do have a few hanging around this winter and trying to keep them alive during this really tough stretch of weather. So the and, and check and compare your, your the nutritional value of your bags of bird seed, and you might be well surprised um, that a lot of the not so good bag, bags of bird seed have very low nutritional value. Uh, a lot of the grains and things are just not. Uh, doing the birds as good as, as the sunflower and safflower and the peanuts. And you look, compare those nutritional values on the back of the bag and let that help you make your decision when you're buying it. And then adding the, you know, and this other, uh, these ingredients in there. Um, you can add, and somebody asked the other day about, you know, they had some uh, currants or something in there and, and that they weren't going to use. And, and can they put those in there? And again, that rule is only if they're, not treated, they're not salted, they're not flavored, they're not, you know, if they're just raw um, dried fruit, yes, use them, put them out there and see if they eat it. I am, if you watch me regularly, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of fruit in my bird seed blends. Now, we sell a lot of it, and then people, some people love it, and some of our blends have a little bit of fruit, some of them have not a lot of fruit, maybe a whole lot of fruit, like fruit and berries, a, a really fruit rich mixture. I have just found it in my yard. When I go to refill my feeders, it's had that in it. A lot of that fruit's just left in the bottom of the um, the feeder, and I tend to flicking it out onto the ground, uh, brushing it out, and I just don't I just don't have a lot of luck with fruit. Now, some people, I guess, really must have a lot of uh, luck with it because we do sell it. All right, how can I attract morning doves? Have a, a, a tray feeder and have seen it. it also depends in California. Boy, you should have a, uh, maybe white wing doves there and morning doves. Um, they're you know they're ground feeders. Uh, one of the so you want that flat open tray for them to land on or a flat surface on the ground uh, to, to spread that on and near near cover. And you know, if you saw my brush pile presentation, you know we had that one picture in Ruth's yard of uh, like 12, 15 morning doves and feeding on the ground right by her brush pile, eating up millet and uh, a ground throw. They morning doves' favorite food is a safflower number one with a bullet with them. They love safflower seed. So that's why in my ground throw mix I make, um, it's a lot of millet, but it's also safflower and a little bit of sunflower in there to take care of more than just the, the native sparrows and um, the juncos, but they will they will do well. Uh, let's see. Oh, Cooper's hawk stalking my feeders. Just had, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, he took a starling. Then we don't mind that. <laughs> nice, do we? So, yeah, I, I, I've got a, a Coopers and a Sharpie that hunt my feeders every day, two and three times a day. If I'm here at home, uh, they come buzzing through. And I saw where one had gotten a Junko the other day because I found a little pile of Junko feathers. Um, and, and so he, he'd taken that. You know, the, it, I know that our heart, you know, <laughs> We're soft-hearted and our parental instincts take over and we want to protect our birds as best we can. But uh, it, it, the predators have their place too. And uh, we say they're like the lions at the water hole. Uh, they know that the, the, the prey is coming uh, to the feeders. And so they know to hunt there and they come buzzing through. 
escape covers, and no matter what you do, no matter you know, you can put all the best cover in the world, they're going to catch one every once in a while, just because that's what they do. It's how they make their living. That's how they feed their babies. Um, so you're going to lose a, a bird every so often. Boy, I wish I could, you know, if they, they would just take starlings and house sparrows, I'd be perfectly happy, but that we can't get them just to do that. So, okay. It says, how many birds? My feeder is by a window. Could that be preventing it? Yeah. Windows, as a, as a rule, I'd say no. Now, it, it, they, they see their reflection, potentially see their reflection in the window. Um, and as f- smart as birds are, they don't know their own reflection. Um, it may be that that's, uh, it, it may be sun angle off of it. it. There could be some influence. So I would experiment with moving that feeder and see if that did. I, I, I doubt that it is, but it could be. So again, placing that feeder closer to cover. Because one of the things, uh, morning doves, we call them the rabbits of the bird world um, because they're their favorite foods for a lot of predators, sharks and hawks and cooper's hawks in particular because they are very slow to take off the ground. So when those pred- those uh, sipiters come flying in, they tend to be easy targets, unfortunately. And so they they, they do count on their camouflage uh, to, to protect them and also, you know, being near cover so they can get out of the way in a hurry. So let's see, Joshua, to me, it's just part of nature. You're right. Fascinating. No, watch my ear. And, and you're right. I mean, uh, predator-prey relationships, um, you know, as long as we're smart about the placement of our feeders and and, and providing escape covers, um, the similar, uh, Cooper's hawks and Sharps and hawks and goshawks, if you're in the north, um, they are natural predators, and I don't mind them. I know they're going to get there every so often. I do what I can to protect my birds, provide the cover, but I also know that they're smart predators and they're going to get one. If, you, and if, again, if you've seen my programs, I'm not a fan of cat, house cats, free roaming house cats, because they're not native predators, natural predators, um, and they, they've only been in our country maybe 100 to 125 for 50 years to the house cats. So in the bird world, that's a new predator to get used to. So some birds still don't even know to be scared of cats. And cats take a, a, a more than their fair share of songbirds, unfortunately. So there you go. <laughs> Not many people say thankfully about snakes, but you're right. Uh, Steve says, thankfully, have plenty of snakes. And mice that the hogs hunt, they hear. Yeah, and and that's you know that's the role of of uh, avian predators like that in the wild. Mostly is to, to and they're going to take the rule of survival in the wild is the least amount of work for the most amount of gain. So they if they can find a snake very easily, they're going to take it. If they have to work really hard to catch a bird then they're not going to try to do it that often. It's just, you know, that's why you make it hard for those predators at your feeder stations and you, uh, placement and, and cover and things. So yeah, they're, you know, they're not going to work too hard to, to find food. And that's why this time of year, we see more of them around our feeders because we have more predator, more prey, more birds, more goldfinches, more juncos. That The biomass alone of the number of birds at feeders right now, especially during this really cold snap, that's going to attack the track the predator's eye. And so that, that's why the, the sharp shins and the coopers come around this time of year and we see them much more frequently. So you're right. I mean, I, <laughs> it's part of nature. And I, and I, and I hear people, you know, they want to go out and shoot their hawks. And, and, and somebody said something the other day about, buying a, or getting a, one of those high-powered slingshots. And also remember, they are protected species. You cannot harm those those hawks in your yard. Uh, it comes with a pretty hefty fine. Now, I have a, had a friend, uh, she still have her friend, she, one of her favorite things to do if the, when the Cooper's hawk showed up at her feeders is she would walk by her refrigerator and hit the ice maker and get a couple of ice cubes in her hand and walk to the open door and throw the ice cubes up. She knew it would never hit it, but she would just try to scare it off. And scaring off predators, you know, I, I can understand you wanting to do that. Uh, you just, you can't harm them. So, well, guys, I really appreciate you tuning in tonight. I knew this was not going to be a very long one. Um, we're traveling uh, starting tomorrow, so we got to do a bunch of packing tonight. Uh, and I'm hopefully next week going to try to do a couple of broadcasts from when we're on the road uh, and kind of, uh, uh, you know, come up with some topics that I can easily do uh, from um, the eastern half of the United States where we're headed. So we will uh, appreciate, again, you tuning in and we will 
be back with you as soon as we can. You know, like I said, I hopefully I'll be have a, a program up next Monday night and then try to do something live next Thursday if possible. We're going to, we're going to do that. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, let's see. Did I get a. Oh, we have pictures at my theater. How can I get more species? That's hummingbird. You see that? Which one is that one? That's it's, the... uh, hummingbirds. I only have finches at my feeder. How can I get more species? Oh, yeah. Okay. The question is uh, that she wants more different, more species at her feeders. She only has finches. Like my fit, my house, my feeders here at my house are very finch dominated. Uh, I think we probably counted about a hundred out here uh, during the snow. And we've got five different finch feeders. We've got seed on the ground and they're all over. And, you know, but we do get the chickadees and the tin mice and the cardinals come in and, and, you know, we do have mixed species, but the finches definitely dominate my feeders. And, and part of it is because, you know, I, I choose to feed a lot of finch seed, um, but I also offer a diverse fix. So, you know, I think part of it is you know, birds like to feed different ways and they like to feed on different seeds. So make sure you're offering uh, different kind of feeders like the a flat tray feeder or, or the, you know, on the ground and a peanut feeder, a wire mesh peanut feeder is great for woodpeckers and that might be a good talk. What's that? That might be a good YouTube video to do about the how to get different. Products. Yeah. Yeah, they, 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 I know I've got videos up uh, on, uh, you know, how to attract uh, the most kinds of birds, but the, the, um, the wife is over there telling me this might be a good YouTube topic to how to, to increase the diversity of the different species that you're in. And part of that, of course, is different parts of the country. You know, Hummingbird, I know you're in California, and so you have a, a, a different suite of birds out there, but we all have chickadees, and we all have titmice in our areas, and we all have woodpeckers in our areas. Now, your woodpeckers might be different than ours, but still attracting them is, is going to be very close to the same. So um, the, the, I, I call those the clingers. So you want to address the clingers with a clinging feeder, the ground feeders. They like the flat trays, like the cardinals. So you want to make sure you got a flat tray surface. And then you got the perch feeders, like the goldfinches, like the land on perches and feed out. And so you won't have feeders that. So you diversify your feeders, diversify seed, and hopefully that's going to diversify your birds. Thank you, Joshua. We, uh, bye, Humbert. Uh, we will see you guys next week. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, send in ideas for future programs if you would. I'd love to know what you want me to talk about. All right. Happy New Year, guys. Bye-bye.